Welcome to this video that will demonstrate the code that I created and modified for this project. As you can see from the window, I've got Visual Studio Code open with my tracker flask, which, as I explained in my report, is the central component of this project. To begin with, I'll be talking through the tracker flask, and then for each function, I'll be going back and forth between the tracker file modifications and tracker files created and the tracker flask to show how they combine and how they work. Alright, so to begin with, this is start of my tracker flask file, and as you can see, I've got all the imported modules or modules that I needed to import for this project. The main ones were JSON, PyMySQL to work with the MySQL database, Flask, which is a Flask server, and AP Scheduler, which is used for the scheduling rules. If we go along, we have the system config, which just takes system time, and the IP of the Huawei modem that I'm using. Here you've got some config for the AP scheduler, where I'm using 20 thread pool and a 5 process pool limit. The job defaults, I've set the max instances of the jobs being run to 2000, because realistically that should not be exceeded. It initialize the background schedule. And then here you've got some code that was commented out. This is the code that would allow the job store to be run for MySQL. So that if the server was to go down, you don't have to reinitialize all the scheduling rules. I've commented out because whilst it did work, there was problems with it removing jobs for some reason with the IDs. It just I was having a bit of an issue. So this was something I will try and implement or remedy soon. Uh, as you go along, you've got the message locator, which I said is the SMS link one two. 3456, which has to be sent to the locator to enable it to get a response back. And here you have some config for MySQL with Flask. Okay, if we scroll down, up you can see quickly just a couple of names of the functions. So you've got single locate, group locate, authenticate, send SMS, receive SMS, message log, format, and add to database. To begin with, I'll start by talking about send SMS. So send SMS is the primary component of this software or this server. So to begin with, this is the function that allows you to be able to send an SMS to the locator. It starts by taking in a phone ID and the number sent to as a list from other functions. Some of them function are single locate and group locate, and we'll talk about them soon. Send them SMS starts by checking if the outbox messages is beyond 50. This enables the program to keep removing messages from the modem so it doesn't overfill, because as soon as it over becomes full, it cannot send any more SMS, which basically stops this whole system. As the next part there, send SMS is to contact the authenticate function. What this does is it retrieves the IP or retrieves the web page of the modem and gets this cookie and the session ID from it to get the token and session ID to allow you to authenticate and enable you to use the API of the modem. So once we get that, we put them into some variables and then we add them to the headers. We get the current system time because to enable the message to be sent, you have to select a time for the message to be sent, which will always be the current time. From there, we go through the list of numbers in case there's more numbers and we format them into two tags. These are XML format tags and it between the phones, it will put the number. You then have SMS where the numbers are all added, the location message, which is SMS link, as we said, the length of the location message, and the time I put in, so this is the request that will be sent to the API to send the SMS. We also increase this SMS counter. This again links back up to here to the 50, so this will keep track of how many messages are sent. This allows you to clear the outbox messages in the modem. Once you've got this, you can then use a post request to send the headers and the data to the send SMS API, and this will enable you to send it. To the locators. Once we have that, we've got some print messages to allow the program to show you what's happening. It will wait 30 seconds and then it will go on to the next part is receive SMS. 
This part, as the name suggests, is the part of the program that will wait for a response from the locator and retrieve the message from the modem. This will pass through the phone ID, the time waited, which is set to 30 because 30 seconds have been waited for it, the system time and the numbers are sent to both this as a list and phone ID as a list. This enables that receive SMS to use the number sensor to retrieve and then pass through the phone the corresponding phone ID into the next steps. I'll talk about that now. If we expand receive SMS, you can see that you have to also authenticate again. So you get the token and the session ID again and add it to the headers. The next part is just a little formatting section and we'll set the default amount of messages to be searched for five if there's only a minimum of four for the let me start that part again this part will check to see how many messages are meant to be sent to if it is less than five it will set the default length of or number of messages to be retrieved from the sms or the modem sorry to five the reason for this is if we retrieve one message the likelihood of picking up the messages is very small especially if multiple locators are responding at once if it is greater than five it will set the length of messages retrieved equal to the number of messages or number of numbers that were sent to in a similar way to before we create an xml request tag which is structured like that where the number of messages is placed here and the box type is one this indicates that it is the inbox we then use a re post request again to a slightly different API URL to SMS the list, which again sends the data for and the headers. Once we do this, this will output the message into an XML format. So hence we need to get the output and put it into an element tree. Once we have the element tree, we need to then retrieve the information from it. In order to do this, we create four lists for message ID, phone numbers, Dates of message and contents of message which is the four key information from that element tree that we need. We then iterate through the tree, looking for the index tag, the phone tag, the date tag, and the content tag, and retrieve the information from it and put it into the list. As you can see from here, we also create a copy of the phone IDs and numbers. This is just for the purpose of the next part. And it's just a nice formatting way of doing it. Okay, so for receive SMS, this is the main component of it. As you can see, it, the first part is checking to see if the time waited is equal to or, or greater than 120. If it is, it won't check. We create an account and then we check for while there's still messages in the inbox phone numbers. So if there's still numbers to check for, this will keep running. So first of all, checks that the phone number that we got from the modem is in one of the numbers that we're sent to. So this will go, yep, yeah, there's five messages, for example, and yes, we have a message from that number that was sent to. So there is a response from that locator. That's what that is indicating. The next part is also checking that the messages after the time that we sent it, because it could be five messages and there could be messages from that number from previous or location request so therefore we need to make sure that this is a current one and therefore we'll do this by checking that it's after the message that was sent this is a good indicator that this is probably the correct message once we do that we get the corresponding phone number date and contact of message for that particular message as well as the message ID the message ID is used to then remove that particular message from the inbox just again stop it filling up and we also get the corresponding index here. This is then passed through to the format function, which I'll talk about next. And it's also sent through to message log function, which will log all the messages and I'll talk about after that. Here we can see we remove the number from the list and the phone IDs. And then here is where the message is deleted from the modem. I'll talk about this function again later as well. The reason why we remove the numbers and phone IDs is so that they don't get checked for again. 
if for whatever reason Nama hasn't or the locator hasn't responded in that time and there's no messages, we will then check wait for, or we will wait 15 seconds and then we'll run the function again. If all messages are found, then we'll respond that the messages have been found. If no messages are found within the two minutes, we print out this message with the number that didn't get a response. And then once again, once this gets beyond 50, so this will clear out any messages that are beyond, that have waited longer than, 20, or longer than two minutes and therefore cannot be deleted up here and therefore clears the inbox, keeping it nice and clean. I will again talk about this function and the clear out, sorry, this one, apologies, and the clear out box function later. If we move on to the next part, as I said, was the format messages. So once the message has been received, it is sent to the format function. It takes the phone ID, the phone number, the date of the message, and the content of the message as inputs. As the locators respond with a very specific format each time, we split the message up by spaces. This is the way this is done, and it uses a lot of uh, new lines as well. We look at the first message of the first word of the message. As explained in my report, if it's a, G a message with the current GPS signal, it will respond with lat and or the latitude, and that is all. If it is responding with the last location, it will start with last colon and then the rest of the message. As you can see, this will check to see if it's last location. If it is, it posts no GPS signal, last known location to be added. This is only posted into the tracker server output and not the tracker, which is an issue we one is in our tracker interface and is something that I'd like to improve upon in the future. Here we split the messages and get the corresponding ID or corresponding indexes that respond or correspond to that information. So we know the latitude is the first index, then we get to split that up and get the information from it, longitude is second and so on. This formats it all nicely for the next part, which is adding it to the database. In a similar way, for current locations, it does the same way, except indexes are one less because there isn't the last message to begin with. This again will pass it to the next function, which will add it to the database, and I will talk about now. As you can see as well from the Ads database, it adds all the information required, so it's got phone ID, phone, message date, latitude, longitude, speed, the device state, the battery, and whether the device is, or whether the location is valid. Early on we set that if it's a current location, it's set to 1, which means it's a current location, and 0 if it's not. In the add database function, we connect to the database using this. We format all the information or all of the information passed through into strings and floats for the database structure. And then we try and we use a try and accept method to insert into the database TC positions, which track database that keeps track of all of the positions of the locators, and we insert all of the information that we have got from the message. This will then be committed and then we have to retrieve the ID of the position that is just all the location that has just been added. The reason for this is then we want to add it, update the TC devices, set the last update position ID and battery in that T in the devices window up on the left as I showed in the previous video demonstrating the tracker interface. As I have mentioned before though on the previous video that there are issues with the way track does it. So while this is updating this information with the current information from the database or current information with the locator tracker has has been a bit funny about displaying it and that is something that will have to be improved upon in the future. If I close this function the last part of the last two parts of the send SMS function is logging the message and deleting the SMS. So if we go to message log, which is the first part, so this will log every message. As I said before, we don't want the modem filling up and it only has a certain capacity, but we might want to keep all the messages that are received for historical value if we need to go back and check. What this would do 
is it gets the message or gets the content of the message, removes all the spaces or removes all the new lines spaces from it. And then we'll create a directory called logs, as you can see here. Create a directory called log and with the message log file. This part will create the file if it's not present there. And what this does, this function does in the file, is it takes all of the phone, the date, the content, gives it an ID at the start, and inputs it into a text file. If I click on the text file here, you can see the format of it now. So you've got the ID, or the ID of the thing, of the message log, the date, the number, the device date, and the content of the message. I close that and go back. The ID is done by taking the last line of it, so for this part, or if there's no message, it will just put ID 0, so there it is, it'll get the last ID and increment it by 1, and then write to the file all the information. That's what the message log does, very simple, and just creates a nice way of logging as a message. If you go to the last main part of the send SMS function, it's delete SMS. This is the function that will delete when we receive the message, we'll delete it from the inbox here. Once again, you have to authenticate with the token session ID, add it to the headers, and you put the delete request. This is sent to this or post request to this particular API where the index is the corresponding value of the message and enables you to delete that particular message. Finally, the last two slightly minor parts of the send SMS is clearing the outbox and clearing the inbox. Clear the outbox deletes all outbox messages, so all that will be in that box or in the outbox is lots of messages saying SMS link 123456. They have no worth to us because the schedule should tell us when it's going to run anyway, and the message log will tell you or roughly tell you when the message was sent anyway. So all this is doing is clearing their messages. Once again, use a token, add it to this request. As you can see, it's very similar to the receive SMS request sent, except the box type is two, which corresponds to the outbox. What this then does is it sends it to get the SMS list, outputs it into a tree, and then for every ID in that, it will remove it using the same method of getting that token and the session ID, sending an XML request and a post request to delete SMS to delete all of the IDs for that. What they should do is delete 50 messages, outbox messages at once nicely and cleanly, and that again will be run every time the message outbox limit gets to 50 or 50 messages are sent. In a similar way, clear inbox performs exactly the same way. The only difference is it will wait until there is four minutes after the current time. So therefore that should stop. This will delete from the inbox messages and it will stop any messages currently being received from the locator being deleted. So the time is currently 15.01. This will wait till 14.57 before or so it will only delete messages that where the date is before 15.47 or 14.57 uh, sorry. This allows to keep delete the 50 messages as before but keeps the inbox nice and clean and make sure it doesn't interact or interfere sorry, with the current messages being received from the locator. Alright, so now that I've demonstrated how the send SMS function works and all the parts of it perform, I'm now going to go back and demonstrate to you how the single locate and group locate functions work. As you can see, these are slightly different to send an SMS in the fact that they start with app, root, and then the ending of a URL. This is how a Flask server works and how information can be passed through to it. What this means is that at localhost 5000, which is the default Flask, port slash locate slash a phone number and an ID is a variable will activate the single locate where the phone number and ID are passed through. 
how this works is that once phone number and ID are passed through, they pass through as variables and these are added to a list and then pass through to send the SMS. How these are passed from the track interface to the Flask server is through the devices window or devices view that I showed you in the previous video. Once the locate button is pressed, where the locate but or button is added through devices edit and devices. Once that button is clicked, this is control for the devices controller file, which is in the same directory. And if we scroll down, you can see on locate click. So once the button is clicked, it would get device and device phone. So it gets the ID and the phone number for that selected device where you've clicked on it. Gets the variables from them and then does a HTML get request where it requests the location or requests the URL for locate with the phone number and ID. What this therefore does then is it passes this through the single locate, pass the information in, and then send SMS starts. For group locate, it's very much done in the same way. In a similar way to single locate, group locate works very much the same way. You've got group locate as the URL with the group ID passed through. Once you get the group ID, it will take the group ID and select all the devices or that's the older locators, IDs and phone numbers on the TC devices table where, the, where they are part of that group. This puts it into rows and then each of this information is added to a list for phone IDs and numbers to send to and sent to send SMS to start the location request process. This is done in very much the same way as single locate where button in the groups edit is added with an on locate click handler which in groups the controller will go down and on locate click it will get the current group get the id and then use a get request again to pass through the id as a variable to the flask server Okay, so now that I've gone through how the sending SMS works and the single locate and group locate works, I'm now going to talk about the rest of my code. For the moment, I'm going to leave the how to add a schedule and the scheduling feature just because it's quite comprehensive and quite extensive, and I'll go come back to it afterwards. So instead, I'll first talk about how to add or remove um, and how to use that all devices part of the tracker that I explained. So to begin with, we start with this function called add device in a similar way it has app root with the URL all devices name and I N E I number as variables. You can see that as it's passed through, you'll get the ID and the user ID as arguments. So once we had this, we then recreate the locator ID, which as I've said before, is using LC plus the serial number of the I N E I number to create it. This program then will connect to the database and will insert into all the table TC all devices that I created and can be seen in the change log. Um, the structure of it, the name, location ID and IMA number from the information we collected. It will then collect the ID from that and then insert into TC user all devices, which is a table that will outline or um, present all of the devices for that particular user. If the device already exists, say for example you're updating the name of the IMEI number, it will just update the, the database entry with that information. In a similar way to remove a device, it goes to this URL with the device ID. The user ID is then taken from the arguments again, and from the table it's deleted from TC all devices and TC user all devices based on this ID and user ID. The final last step of the all devices is retrieving the devices so that they can be displayed in a JSON format, which is very similar to how Tracker API works anyway. And this will allow the program or Tracker to then retrieve this information into a readable format and then display it 
and I'll show you them files in just seconds. So first of all, we get the user ID again, and then we select the device ID from all of the user devices. Once we've got all them IDs, we then go back to the TCL devices table and retrieve all the devices again that are matched them IDs. This information from the table is then formatted into a dictionary which is put into JSON format which is returned. This is how the information is read back from the line. Okay, now to show you how the information is displayed and how this was created through Tracker. The first thing we did, I did, sorry, was create a store. This has the URL, localhost, with all devices and get, which as we go back to Tracker Flask, matches the URL of this. This, we tell it's a JSON format, it's going back, and the extra parameters is the ID, so we add so what this does is it adds the user ID as part of that URL when it requests it. The next part is creating a model. So this defines the layout or the format of the form of, of the store, apologies. So it's got an ID, a name, locate ID, and EI. This matches the format of the table, of the table in the database. Next step is the edit window which is the window you see when you click settings and go to all devices as you can see it's very simple and all it is is you specify a controller as all the other pages done it has a toolbar for all devices modified which I'll talk about in just a second which is just the plus the plus for add the edit and the remove toolbar icons you then have the columns for shared name ID and IME and number as was shown This is a very standard controller, which is identical to all of the ones, all of the similar ones for Tracker and hasn't really been changed other than part, unnecessary parts being removed from it. In toolbar, well, as we're talking about that modified toolbar, we keep it very much the same as normal, but it's different in the sense that the controller used is slightly different. Because of the way that we're retrieving data from it, we remove parts of the toolbar has a bit of an issue, so if I switch to controller, you can see that on add click and edit click are very much the same. For remove click, however, we have to get the device, the device ID and the user, and use that to then send the remove device URL that will go back to this tracker and therefore remove the method, remove the device from it. The next part of creating all devices is creating the all devices form window that is clicked when you click add or edit on the all devices window. What this shows is you've got a text field for ID and display for the locator ID as shown in the previous video. This is the part where you couldn't modify. You've also got a text field for name and a number field for ID and number and then the buttons for save and close. When the save button is closed, we go to the controller part of it, and you can see that the user ID and the values from the table are or values from the form are retrieved. These are then added to the URL request, which is sent to the Flask server. As described before, and if I go back to the Flask server, that URL matches the format for add device. The device is then or well, device is then added to the table. At the end, you then get the store for all registered devices, which is the one we meant, that I mentioned back here. And you reload it so that the, all the values for it are shown when you close it again. So now that I've discussed how to use all devices or how the all devices works for Tracker using the Flask or Tracker Flask server, I'm now going to demonstrate the, or highlight the most extensive part of the coding that I did for this project and that is the sh creating a schedule or the ability to create or create schedules for locating devices. To begin with, we'll start with the schedule add. So again, as with all the features of this, it has the app root 
with the URL containing some important information. Which one create, has the most information included out of any of the URLs and has, as you can see, its user ID all the way up to disabled for all of the, the form fields that are present in the dialog box that I showed in my previous video. If I expand this, you can see it begins with the formatting data for the database. This includes converting the Boolean values from 0 to 1 and splitting the values up so you can get the key information. And if the value is for timing is for custom window, setting the Boolean from cell to equal true to indicate this. As with all of the database adding parts of this program, it will update the database TC schedules which are created and you can see in the change log uh, out of 4.1 scheduling. As you can see this just updates the table and sets the values. It also checks to see if the, if the device is null or the group is null but it shouldn't be because of the checks that we have on it later. Then it should end the schedule rule and remove it. If the rule has been disabled we want to remove the schedule because it's not operational anymore and if the rule is enabled we, and obviously the scheduling rule has been updated we want to remove the previous one and create a new one based on the new information. If the schedule isn't present it will insert into TC schedules, get the ID and then insert into the TC user schedules as similar to all the other ones and then performs the same function as the previous one so if the device is null on group it will remove it but that's not possible. If the device is disabled, it will remove the schedule, which won't do anything again because the rule isn't there. And if the device isn't disabled, if the rule isn't disabled, it will create a rule. Once we've done that, you can, apologies, once you can see that, we then pass it through to the next function, which is create schedule rule. We go to that function. You can see a variety of information is passed through to it. It starts by formatting the start time for cron format. Once it does that, it creates a job that calls another function which will actually initialize the actual schedule rule for this. So for example, if you're scheduling this for every day at three o'clock in the afternoon, the start schedule rule is the function to do this. All this job is acting as is the start date and time feature or parameter for the scheduling rules. It passes through again a variety of information, so we'll go to that next function, which is start schedule rules. And as you can see, it begins by setting the default all to asterisk. This is the default format for cron. So, for example, default day as asterisk will just leave it will be every day unless specified otherwise, or just it will just be blank if not specified otherwise. It begins by formatting the column for period or the data for period. So, if the value is every it will split the value up and then we'll look to see if the format is days, weeks and months and then set the particular or specific field or variable to that. So for if the form format is days, it will set default day equal to every X amount of days. So for example, if it's every two days, this will end up reading default is equal to asterisk slash two, which means that in cron format every two days. If a day is selected for a period, however, it will split it up and create a list of them if there's more than one. And this will change it, the value to default DOW, which is default day of the week, to this. And for timing, it does it very much the same way. It sets default values and then you have two booleans. From till, which as already shown before, is a boolean to indicate whether a custom window has been selected. And every min, which is an extension of this, and there's a boolean to determine whether the format for the window or the custom window is minutes or hours. If we go to timing, you can see that again we split it by every in the same way as for period. If timing is greater than nine or the length of it, that indicates that, or less than nine, and not every, it indicates that the timing selection is a custom hour. So it splits it up and puts that information in for default hour and minute. If it's nothing else, it, or if it's not in every format or it's not time for it, it means that it must be in the format of custom window. For this, it sets the boolean 
to indicate that this is true, so from till is true, and therefore it's a custom window. Then it splits the values up to get from the every and till information from that. Finally, it will format the end date into or split it up into hours and minutes so that it can be passed through into the cron add or the cron format for add to job. If you can see, as you can see here, if the time in this custom window, so as we said before, from till indicates that, we need to call another function to create jobs, specific jobs for the from and the till times, as well as resume on and pause them. So this calls the schedule window with values and is run at the default hour and default minute. This means that for um, which is essentially working as from this time, schedule window will be run, say from the front time is four o'clock. At four o'clock this will be run. You also at the same time create an end schedule rule to remove the schedule once it is done, once the end date is reached. In a similar way, if it's not custom window, it will call info check, which I'll talk about next, which will eventually send an SMS because custom window hasn't been selected. There only needs to be the three jobs to start, to run the job to send the SMS, and the end schedule rule. If I move back up now to info check, you can see how it performs or what its function is. So info check. The purpose of this is to check that there is values of phone IDs and numbers sent to. So when a schedule rule is run multiple times, the first time it will always have the values as an argument. However, the second time, for some reason with AP scheduler, the arguments are blank. To remedy this, I created an info check, which will check to see if the values are blank. If they are, it will then call the next function, which is get info. What this will do is it will take the device and group and it will retrieve the IDs and phone numbers for the devices that match these device or group values or IDs and put them into a list as before with phone IDs and numbers sent to InfoCheck will then send the SMS using this information. Once this is done, the schedule will be good for, for the ones that are not custom window will just begin and will be run at this specific time and period based on this with these numbers. Now moving on to the custom window options. So as I said for custom windows it will cause the function schedule window. If we go to schedule window we can see that there's a multitude of variables passed through to it. It starts by selecting the from hour until hour from default hour until hour until minute respectively. It then sets the values default and very much does the formatting in the same or completes the formatting the same way as the previous function for period and for timing. So for period and just for period, apologies, not for timing. Once that is done, it will check to see if every minute. So this, as I said before, is this for custom window? It's every X amount of minutes. It will add the job for info check, which is as I've just discussed what that does, which will start the rule, but it also creates a pause schedule and a resume schedule. This works so that once the till time is reached, so if the time, if the custom window is every five minutes from one o'clock in the afternoon all the way to six o'clock in, in the evening, then at six o'clock, the pause schedule will pause that time until the next day when it'll be resumed at 1 p.m. in the afternoon or 1 p.m. and it will resume the schedule and it will continue this until the end date is reached. That is the purpose of the resume and the pause schedule is for that function. If every minute is false, this determines that it's every X amount of hours. Therefore, our job is again, sorry, a job is added for info check based on this, and a pause schedule and resume schedule is created based on the run time, the run till and the from time, the run, the from hour and time, hour and minute and the till hour and minute. I'll expand pause schedule and resume schedule just to see what they do but they're very simple it's just a pause job and a resume job. The next part is end schedule rule so once as you've seen in each of them there's an add, a job is added to end the schedule rule once 
the end date is reached. To do this, we format the schedule IDs because each of the schedules that I created or jobs I created have an ID, a specific ID. So for this one, it's pause with the schedule ID number. For this one, it's for the main schedule that sends the SMS, they all have the format schedule ID, which is just equal to the number. If from till suggesting a custom window option is selected, you have to remove the start ID or pause what pause job and the resume job. Once that is done, or and or for all of the options, even ones that aren't custom when timing is not set to custom window, it will then remove the job that started the job or started the rule, and then it will also remove the ones or that created the actual rule and removes the end schedule rule or the the ending date job that is currently being run. At the end of this, therefore, let's say for example, if you only had one rule once it hits the end, or for that particular rule once it hits the end date, this will be run and all jobs for that particular rule will be removed. The next part of it pertains to how to collect the schedules or how to format the schedules so they can be accessed into Tracker. Using this function called get schedules, we have the root app root with the URL equal to this. If I expand this, you can see we get the user ID as an argument. Using that, we grab all the schedule IDs from the table user schedules. This indicates for that particular user, these are all the schedules that this user has set. From that, we then do another database query that will select everything from the date the, for every single ID that we retrieved previously. It will get the row including all of the information from the TC schedules where the ID matches that. So therefore, if you've got five IDs here, five times for each of them, five schedule IDs, it will look for the TC schedules and get all the information for that schedule. This is then put into a list and for format or for the disabled column as on the data it's saved as a binary value, we convert it to a true or false value depending on if it's a zero or a one. What we end up with after the whole of that is a list called schedule rules with all of all of the information for that sh the schedules for that particular user. From there though, to be able to format even better, we want to add some extra headers for the custom values, custom fields for period and timing, as well as add one for starting date and end date, just to separate them so they can be added back into our dialog box, and I'll talk about that slightly a bit later. The next part of this is therefore going through schedule rules and getting the period value from it. If the period value is equal to a custom day, then we will set the value for period to custom day, custom d even, sorry, which is the, is the value for that. And if the value is custom period, then we will also set period in the list to custom p. Once we've done that, we will also get the values for period value and period format if it's in this way all of the values for days and get them into the variable days. We will then extend the list for schedule rules to include this information. In the same way we'll do that for timing where we get the time and the start date and the end date. We set the timing value equal to custom H for if it's custom hour and custom window equal to custom W if timing the custom window and we set the values for our value for custom h and from value time every value time every format until value for if it's a custom window the purpose of doing all of this is splitting up all these values is when we get it back into when we want to edit a schedule rule into in our dialogue or in, in our edit when we open up a dialogue box each of the form fields should be filled with that information. 
so the user doesn't have to re-enter that information if they're only making a small change. Continue with this, as you can see, we then again extend the list in, cut in schedule of rules with these values. Finally, these values are added to a dictionary and dumped into JFold, converting into JSON format. Further to this, if you we have a JSON date converter because JSON doesn't handle date time values from MySQL well, so this converts it all into string values. Finally, the last part of my tracker class or my class server file to do with scheduling is how to remove a schedule. What this does is it takes the schedule ID and the user ID as an argument from the URL and it just all it does is just delete from the TC schedules and TC user schedules that particular schedule. Now that I've discussed how the Flask server handles scheduling, we're now going to move over to Tracker and explain each part that had to be created to allow this to be made. As I said before in my previous video, this is the most comprehensive and extensive part of my coding and was the most amount of work. If we move over to the Tracker Flask, Alright, so now that I've given you an overview of the coding in the Flask server for the scheduling feature, I'm now going to shift over to the Tracker files to show you how I was able to implement it into Tracker or how I implemented it into Tracker. The first file we're going to look at is the store file for all schedules. What this will do is work slightly differently to the previous stores or the store that I showed you for the grouping feature or the groups. And all devices in the sense that it specifies the URL for the Flask server with the URL matching format matching that of scheduler add or schedule add or sorry get schedules as shown here it also specifies that the next parameter will ID equal to force because what we'll do is we'll, what it does is it passes through the ID for the user into this URL as an argument. The next part I was I had to create a model that matched the database or the JSON format that I'd be retrieving when I got the date when I got that data back in that get schedules function. As you can see each of these match that format and so that this data can be processed. Once I'd done that I was then able to create an edit view what this is, is the window that you see when I click the settings and the schedules, this is that window shown. It creates the columns, each of the columns, names, devices, groups, period, timing, the start date, end time, and the disabled value, which is hidden, which can be selected when you click columns. Each of these would just get the data index from it as standard, but they do a bit of rendering to make the information a bit easier to read and a bit nicer to look at. They also have the shit I had to create schedules controller, which is very similar to all the other edit views controllers and doesn't really do much except I've removed a lot of unnecessary code for it. So if you remember from the previous video, once you have the edit or the the window open you can click add or edit this particular rule once you do you open up the dialog which is created using this file this is a view dialog and as the controller shape your controller up here on the right what this does is it creates a form of each of the values most in text fields tag fields and so as you go along so you've got the text field for name tag field for devices groups and the fields or the, the tag fields for period or the combo boxes for period as well as all of the fields that are then actually shown when you click custom and similar for timing you've got the combo box and the values that are shown once you click the custom options finally you've got the date fields and time fields for start date and start time 
and for any date and any time, as you can see here. The names of these correspond to each of the names in the schedule module. So when we created or when I created the JSON file from the database, each of these names match the names that were added in the Flask server so that when they're processed and when you click into the dialog and edit, the start time will be shown or the start the values for each of these will be shown. This again allows, as already previously mentioned, allows you to just click edit and continue or just edit the rule nice and easily with the previous values and then modify them without having to repeat the values every single time. The schedule controller is quite extensive though, and compared to a lot of the dialog ones that are very simple, this is actually quite extensive. The first part I'll leave on save click for the moment and focus on, on period change and on timing change. If I go back to dialog, you can see for the period field and for the timing field you have a listener for when the value is changed, it runs a function called on period change and on timing change. If I go back to the controller, what this does, you notice know, there's a lot of a piece of code, is it shows the relevant field. If I go to period, for example, if custom day is shown, it will show the period day field, which allows you to select the days. If you select custom period, it will then it will hide the day field and instead show the every field, which allows you to select every X amount of days, weeks, or months. In a similar way for the timing, if you select custom hour, it will show the hour field and hide all of the from every until field. So if you switch between different timings and the same for period, if you go from a custom hour to every two days and then back again, it should hide the values each, hide the fields that aren't required. For custom window again, the hour value is hidden whereas the from every until fields are shown. Now that's broken about that, I can hide these. And we'll now talk about what happens when you have the dialog and you click save. For most of the other previous features in Tracker, they're able to just go through the store and the API. The problem with this is I had issues with this, trying to get the API to work in a coherent manner and allow me to do this through the API modifying the back end of the code, which is one of the reasons why a lot of the features in the Tracker Flask or a lot of the functions ended up in the Tracker Flask, other than the ability to locate and send it a SMS to locate the locators. Once the save button is clicked, it creates it, it creates a method for validating the fields and making sure that they're the correct values or in correct format. This is done by creating a message variable, a valid is equal to true variable, and a list of the messages, error messages. What then happens is you get use, the user ID is retrieved as well as all of the variables from that form. Here you see the first validation, which is to check that the name isn't empty. If it is, it pushes the message, which will be popular, which is shown in an error box later on, similar to how I demonstrated for if end date was off, was before start date in my tracker demonstration. As you can see, you've got some more devices and just make, it just formats it, grabs the information and formats it slightly. You then make sure the program then checks to see if that the values are not null. If they are, it selects a message or sends a message saying that there must be a device or a group selected. The period, you retrieve it and then it formats the data or formats the information depending on the variable choose. So for example, in period custom, it will then check to make sure that the day field isn't empty and it will set period it will set period equal to the day selected, which can then be passed or as I'll discuss will then be passed to tracker or passed to fast server apologies. As you can see for each of them they retrieve the information relevant for that particular for the fields particular for that particular option. So for here for custom period it will select the option for every value in every format fields. It will then also make sure that both these values are filled. 
which continues for all of them, where they basically just grab the field, format them, and then check to make sure that they are the correct values so they're not empty, and then in the right format if needed. For example, it will make, like as already discussed, it will make sure that Right, so as we go along, we then get starting date and time. This is used to retrieve the starting date from the calendar part and the time, and then format it and put them together into one variable called starting and ending, which can then be passed to our server. The final part of this, or the final part of the form, the controlling of the form, is in a lot of checks to make sure that the starting date and ending date and time are not empty to make sure that starting date is not or the end date is not before the starting date and if the starting date and ending date are the same date that the time is for ending time is after the starting time Finally, what this does is it checks that if the if the valid is true. So as you can see for each of the checks, if the check is fails, it sets the, the value to valid equal to false. So if it's true, determine it or indicating that all the, the values or the forms, the fields, the form fields, the values in the form are valid, then it will use a URL get request to the file server and pass through all of the information required. As you can see, it's quite extensive. If the validation fails, it will post a, or create an error message as we, I showed in my previous video or in my tracker demonstration video with all of the error messages. Something to discuss that I forgot to mention also with the dialogue is that for each of the dialogue boxes for timing and period, they had to, the values were populated. So for all of the custom, two custom and the five predefined values, were stored in a local store which I had to create and I was going to swipe over. So you've got schedule periods where you have the keys and the names for each of them, so custom day, custom period, every one day is up to every two weeks. Then for days, it's stored in a store in very much the same way. Local store, where you have Monday to Sunday shown. You also have the formats for when you select the custom period option, so you've got days, weeks, months. And in the same way for timing, you also have them shown so you've got the two custom and the five predefined options here that populate both of these populate all the combo boxes or the combo box of timing. You've also got timing formats for minutes and hours if custom window is selected and you can select the choice of every X amount of minutes and hours. This is stored in this local store shown here. Finally, the last part of the modification I made or creation I made to the track interface to allow the scheduling feature to work is modifying the toolbar. As also shown with the all devices, this part of the toolbar wasn't changed, but the controller was. In the same way, add click was remained the same and edit click remained the same. However, for remove click, we had to get the oh, I had to get the schedule ID and the user ID, and then remove use the post that to the custom URL or the URL to the Flask server which would then initialize the removal of that from the database and the store. Once we've done that or once that's been done the interface or program has to reload the all schedules so that the window is current up to date with current information and will show so if you've got five devices remove the last one that will only show the four devices that remain. I hope this explains how the scheduling thing works. I understand that there's a lot of code and lots on this, or lots to comprehend with it.
So last but not least, I move on to the last part of the implementation that I had made with this project, which was allowing the user to add group colors or colors to the groups and then to display them in all devices as well as the groups views. This didn't have any involvement with the Flask server that I used and was only done using the Tracker Java backend and the JavaScript frontend. So to begin with, in the model of the Java backend for group, I added in this part of the code. What this is just defines or is that there's a string for group color, which is equal to the hex value or hex value of a color, and a function to get the color and a function to set the group color. This is a standard function of how the API works, and as you can see already, it's very similar to how it was done for name. Once I've done that, I had to modify the model used for groups and add group color and a string so that it could be formatted, it could be added back and forth, um, it can be added, to, added and edited as well. Once I've done that, the next step was enabling a user to add a color or change the colors. To do this, I modified the, the, modified the group dialog where I added a new field container which can called color display, which contained the display field, which would show the group color or the color in hex, and a color picker, which I showed in my previous video. This is the part that you'd be able to select the box with the color, and that would, once saved, that would be able to define the color. As you can see with group color, there was no, on group controller, there was no modifications needed. This is very much the same way as how all the windows that I, other than the ones that I added, save and save the information from the forms into a database. The next part of allowing the user to define the color or showing the color is in the groups window on the groups edit window having a column for that group color as you can see i create a data index for the group color that matches the id defining the group model i set the filter to string for the renderer i created an array of colors for white text what this is was i selected out of the 40 colors i realized that some of the colors where black text would not be visible and would be hard to see therefore I decided to use white text for them ones instead. What this does is if it checks the, the color value or the, the value for the color, and if it's in this array, it will change the color to white for the text color. If not, it will change it to black. And then at the end, it changes the style of it, the background color equal to that, and the text color. Finally, the last step in this or the last step for the group color as well as the last modification I made to tracker is in the devices edit window. From here you can see for group ID I created a function that would get the color from the store or the, the group store for that particular ID and set the color in the same way with the color for text changing it or the color the text color changing depending on the value of the colour. This part is very much the same as the attribute format and was just copied from that but just added to this. So as you can see here, originally you had a renderer tracker attribute formatter. All this function bid in this file was to carry out this function which was to get the group ID and get the name instead. So instead of having a list of the group IDs, so one upwards to whatever value you instead get the name like in my example was gang one and demonstration for example now that i've shown you how i've done group color i'll move on to the last final parts or modifications i made to tracker first one is if i scroll down was for status for status and yeah for status is the main one for last update to an extent as well. Originally status was defined by 
the back end of the Java, of the Java back end, and I modified it so instead that it was based on the battery life. So you have online, so if the battery life is above 15, low battery if it's between 15 and 5%, critical battery if battery life is below 5% and not zero, and if battery life is zero, the, the status becomes unknown because we don't know the state, the, the state of that locator. What this then does is change the background color of the status field or column to the color corresponding into the, device, the store which is device status. If I scroll over here and I open the store for device statuses. You can see for online you get long green, low battery yellow, critical battery red and unknown is a light grey color. What this render finally does is it returns the name of the status which is shown in this store. So that is the end of all the modifications and this video demonstrating or showing and talking about the code that I created and modified for this project. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and thank you for watching. Goodbye.